meetings in 2024. But I'm here with you, so just go ahead and put your name in the chat right here. And let us know you were here. All right. And every question, everything that you want to interact with us, you can put it in the chat. If you're on our StreamYard platform um, with us right now, um, it would be a combination of conversation when we are ready. Okay. All right. So let us go ahead and start by going to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. I want to thank you for this new day that you have given to us today. Thank you, oh Father God, for just your love and mercy that you have poured out upon us. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you tonight. And so as I surrender to you tonight, this Bible study lesson, I ask that you give us wisdom and discernment. Help us to understand everything from your holy word and allow your words to transform us, strengthen us, and help us to grow. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in session three, where we are talking about the entitlement of a church. You know, as we have moved on to, this is really about not making my church about our preference. But what it's about is about entitlement and the church. All right. And so, first, we as we are getting ready to move into this, one of the things I want us to look at is the definition of entitlement, because there's various degree of definition of entitlement. To really make it easier, entitlement is just the things that you believe you deserve. But here is the formal definition of it. The formal definition of entitlement is that the things the unjustified assumption that one has the right to certain advantages of preferences and treatment. And here are some of the things that really was an example that came from that definition that said that some senator was talking and he said, their sense of entitlement, I don't want and call it arrogant, makes dealing with some people difficult. All right. So that is like more of the formal definition and a word to go with it's a whole person to understand but pretty much this is what it means that we think we are entitled to things that we may not deserve all right and so with that definition i want us to think about how does that come into play in the part of jesus christ his church and his kingdom that's a whole another different we have different ways of showing entitlement in church that we do out in the world like the statement that we just did and so here are three ways i'm going to list three things that the church actually do these are only three things <laughs> there are actually other things but here are the three things the first is the music that is played Woo! some people may think that's not the music that i want to hear or i need a much better music or those music are not the ones that our church listen to then the second thing is the way the money is used somebody may be like oh the pastor needs to use the money to purchase such and such and such only or you know how do we deal with what the money is used or not used and so these are just some of the way and the final way is a certain way things are done for example you know the way things are done within the church environment or the way things are done in the church program you know like this is the way you're supposed to fo follow the schedule of certain ways you get what i'm saying so that could also be it that could also be it all right but here is the thing this is very important every believer is called to a life of service every believer is called to a life of service the willingness to serve others is not natural in our world. You hear that? It's not natural in our world. But for the people that serve Jesus and follow Jesus, this is the natural way to do things. When you become a child of God, you are letting go of the natural thing of the world and you are seeking the things that are different. So the way how your mindset operates and run is not the way our the world mindset operates and runs so yes it is unnatural 
in the world for us to serve others. Right now in 2024, I'm going to tell you almost everywhere you go, it's every man for himself. And it's going to keep going like this. The closer we get to the end of the world, people are always going to be just more concerned about themselves than they are about others. This doesn't mean that everyone is like this, but a lot of people are. There are still believers in the world who follow the concept of servanthood. There are still some good believers in the world, good people who are willing to serve and follow in the way Jesus asks us to. So, yes. But there is a high percentage of people who believe as every man for himself, all right? And that's not how Jesus wants us to be. The willingness to serve others is what he asks for us. And so we're going to just think about this, about this and reflect on the scripture. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 20, 28, in this part, Jesus says, you know, about what is it that he wants his disciples to do. So let's look at that scripture now. Matthew chapter 20, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and we're going to read from verse 20 to 28. Then the mother of James and John, the son of Jebedee, came to Jesus with her son. She kneeled respectively to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in place of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh, yes, he replied. Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he had chosen. When the ten disciples heard John and James at X, they were ignorant. And Jesus called them together and said, You know the rules that the ruler in this world lorded over their people, and the officials flaunt their authority over those who are under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be leader among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave for even the son of man came not to be served but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many as we look at this scripture here, there are some things that popped up on my mind that I just want to quickly take a look at. Jesus is really explaining what it's like and what he wants us to be as his children or as his disciple. But as I read the scripture, I also realize why, you know, a lot of people struggle with Christianity because internally they may not have the desire to be servant. Another thing is, as African American, the word slave doesn't run very easy with us. Our history has taught us that when it comes to slavery, you know, there is abundance of disappointment and hurt. But Jesus is not asking you to be under anyone as slave. He's asking you to be his slave. And what we know about our Savior is that he's loving, he's kind, and he brings hope and comfort. So it's really the opposite of what human slave is when we think of our savior, serving our savior as our master. So we are becoming slaves to Jesus. But here it says slave to others. And that may be difficult for a lot of us to process, especially African-American, because we have been through some, some terrible things when we are called slave. And so they are not, you know, looking at or trying or seeking to be anyone's slave anymore since Christ brings us freedom. But this type of slave is not Jesus telling you to be anyone's slave. What he's saying is that you have to have the mindset to serve in such a capacity. If he wants to be at higher places in heaven, you got to be willing to give up yourself to serve others, give up your preferences to serve others. Another thing, you know how she acts of her son can sit in these place of honor. Who is this? Who is this person to ask for her son? You know, most mothers are like that. We want what's best for her children. 
And so she wants her children to be at the highest level in God's kingdom. So it's not that she has she asking for something wrong, it's just she's being bold. Some of us need to be bold also when we go out into the world to serve others. Be bold in our faith. Be bold to say we are children of God. Jesus told her that her son will definitely drink of this cup. Do you know what? Both James and John were persecuted. James was persecuted by Arrow of Agrippa. He was killed by him, martyred by him, and John was sent away to an island. We heard that John died as a whole age, but we know that he was um he was um abundant on this island by himself. So they did drink of the same bitter cup that Jesus did. But he said they will, but they don't know if they will be able to handle it. And so as we keep reading the scripture, we go over to 24 going down. I was really impressed with Jesus' disciple having an argument about themselves. So even while they were there with Jesus, they were still experiencing the fight of the flesh. Here yeah, was pride, ego, you know, they were still struggling with those stuff. And so it's not really easy. It's really, it's not really easy as a human being to, to give up those things that our flesh desire, our ego, our pride, the right to do something and so forth. But in Jesus' world, it's not acceptable. And that's what he told his very disciple. Here they were with the Savior and they were arguing because they feel that those two didn't have the right to ask to go to his left or his right. But here I want to look at this scripture again. If we could just look at verse 26 to 28 again. It says here, but among you it will be different. Mm. Jesus wants us to be what? Different. Let me read that again. But among you, you will be different. Whoever wants to be leader among you must be your servant. And that's a big thing because it means that everyone who is in the capacity of Christian leadership should be willing to be servant to the people that Christ gives them. We have to try our best to be servant. It's not about title. It's not about standing on the podium. It's about serving the people that God has given to you. Verse 27 said, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave among you. And so he is not talking about we being slave for someone else out there. He's talking about the church, among the people of God, those who want to be slave among you. I'm going to give you an example of this really quickly. I know someone, a minister in our church, when I was just in, in, the, pro, in the program of training to become a minister, and she was so full of the Holy Spirit. She was full of a spirit of god okay and um i remember one sat one saturday i came much earlier than my meeting like my meeting was like nine but i just i showed up at church like eight and she was cleaning the bathroom and i was like what's going on what are you doing there she said i'm just cleaning the bathroom so i'm like don't we have a, a, a cleaning people that come in and do that she said yes but this is fine I don't mind doing this. Everyone need a clean bathroom. And it wasn't, look, it wasn't looking clean when I came in anyway. And she was a minister. And that really tugged on my heart to show you what you're really supposed to do. And this is what Jesus mean when he said that you must be willing to be slave among you. And now Jesus did not come to be served. He said, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is the greatest thing about servanthood. And so yes, every believer are called to a life of service and Jesus shows us in the scripture, that's what he wants of us. Let's just be honest. Jesus is gracious and kind to this mother. He didn't put her aside and said, why you come to ask me that? But he gave her, she also, you know, this is why I say questions are so important. It doesn't matter how silly it may sound. Because this mom came and asked Jesus that question. It gave us an opportunity to know this thing. If nobody asks ask this question, we will not know that this thing where we have to believe. So instead, he, he used her as an example 
for what we should do. So Jesus' example, he is the King of King. He is the Lord of Lord. And he came not to be served, but to be servant for all. And we are to constantly seek to do the things that this. All right, so I don't know if anybody here ever heard of church huddle, or it's called holy huddle. A long time ago, I didn't even know this was this other name to it. But what holy huddle is, you know, where everyone go and we talk to whoever we ever every every place within the church you will see a bunch of believers gathered together talking to each other. Holy adult. <laughs> and there's a lot of holy adult in church, you know, you're looking at everybody back and these three or four people gathered together and they're just talking among themselves, right? That is called holy adult. And now this is not what Jesus this is not wrong. But in the prospect of we having a visitor or somebody coming in, all they see is people talking to themselves, so they feel exempt. And so churches does not need to get rid of all the hurdle, but they has to make sure that it's open to everyone to come in and not be just looking at everybody back, right? And so the, we must remember the church and its members were called to be a hospital for sinners. Can you believe if you go to a hospital and you see all these bunch of nurses, nurses and doctors talking among themselves and just ignoring you? How would you feel about that? And so we are called to be a hospital for sinners. So we must have an open policy where we don't just go find out with each other and talk to, but we are willing to let everyone come in. And so Jesus gave everyone the Great Commission, everyone, out of his disciples. He didn't say, okay, those do the give of teaching, do that. No, he said everyone in Matthew chapter 28, he said, go therefore and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. As much as we know that Christ is calling all of us to go out there and make the disciple, one of the powerful things about this is that Jesus said, I will be with you until the end of age. It's funny about that, right? To think about if Christ should come to churches today, if he should walk into your church, what would he see? What would he feel about what he see? How would he feel about each of us and the role we are playing as a member of our church? Do you think he will feel happy about it? Would he feel that you are doing what you are supposed to do? I love that you're going out there. You see, being a tried disciple is not just about in the church. We have to go outside the community and do things too. We have to go out and make disciples. Today, we have great opportunity to do that, going online and reaching as much people with the gospel. There are many countries today where the gospel is illegal, but YouTube is not, to God be the glory. <laughs> and so that's why we have to open our mind to how we reach people out there. And we must think of disciple making outside of just the gathering of a church. You can't make disciple when you gather together for church. That's for worship. That's for experience. That's for, so you should have already made them before you even come into the church. But in the book... Rainer, Thomas Rainer, in this book, he gave 10, 10 dominant traits. He said he gave us, this is on page 36 and 37, he gave us 10 dominant traits that he believed churches are, um, after he surveyed a bunch of churches, he found these 10 dominant traits that are inwardly focused. So I'm going to read those for you, and I want you to think about the church that you are now and ask yourself if these traits are with them. All right, so let's go through some of these traits. The first one is worship war. <laughs> one or more faction of a church want the music just the way it is. All right, no changes, and they get angry and demand to change, or the order of the service must remain constant. Are in certain way. All right. Here's the next thing. Corolonia miniature meeting. The church spent an inordinate amount of time in different meetings. Most of the meeting deal with the most inconsequential item. Such as the great, but while the great commission and the great commandment is really the topic of these meetings. 
The charting is facility focus. The charge facility developer iconic status. One of the highest priority in the church is the protection and the preservation of the room, the furniture, other visible part of a church building and the cemetery or the ground of a church. Now, number four, program driven. Now every church has program, even if they don't admit it. When we start doing a ministry certain ways, it take a pragmatic status. The problem is not with the program. The problem is developed when the program becomes an end instead of a mean to greater ministry. In wardly focused budget. In wardly focused budget. A disappropriate share of the budget is used to meet the need and the comfort of the church and its member instead of outside the wall of a church. Then Attitude of antagonist. I'm so sorry. Inordinate demand for pastoral care. And inordinate demand for pastoral care. All church members deserve care and concern. All right. All of them deserve their care and concern, especially in time of need and crisis. Problem develop. However, when the church members are unreasonable expectation for even minor matters, some members expect the pastoral staff to visit them regular merely because they have a membership status. Yes. <laughs> Number seven, attitude of entitlement. This issue could be a catch all for many of the, the points here. The overarching attitude is one of demanding and having a sense of deserving special treatment. All right. Number eight, greater concern about change than the gospel. Almost any noticeable change in the church evokes and hear of many. Those with the same passion are, are you know, the evidence about doing the work of the gospel to change life. Number nine, anger and hostility. Members are consistently angry. They regularly express hostility towards the church, the staff, the members, and the pastor. This is what comes from when love has left the building. And finally, number 10, evangelistic apathy. Very few members share their faith on a regular basis. More are concerned about their own needs rather than the greatest internal need of the world and the community they are. So those are the 10 things. Do you think any of these of your churches, if you are online on the Zoom and you would like to speak, you can raise your hand, but look in all of these, but does any one of these any one of these point to your church. I want you to think about that. You can put us in the comment if you're online, but as any one of these 10 things, you think your church struggle with any of these behavior patterns. And what are some ways that we can focus our attention outside the wall of a church? Um, and Gianni, can you unmute? And then move on with the video on to the stage, please. Not the one that can take off the one that can. Anyone who's got anyone have? Sister Sharon? Well, do you, believe, do you believe the churches as any one of those churches? Well, I, I believe that, you know, it's hard to uh, differentiate against all 10 of them. But I see uh, quite a few in, in, in some of them because I see mm -hmm. the uh, church like 
in a disarray when they don't agree with everyone. I, I can see that there are some people who have their own ideas and they keep it to themselves. And then everything just seems like it's a, 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 a shambles. And I, that's what I see. That's what I see. Yes, yeah. Oh, she wasn't moved. Okay. Okay. You are you are time out a little bit, Sister Sharon. But thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Um, who is the next person on the screen? Oh, uh, Sister Julie, do you have any command of those ten things that we share? No. Okay. All right. All right. So there is one thing that I think that I, I knew from my past church that we did is the, um, the evangelical equity for me, because I remember that I never really used to share my faith as much as possible. When I was working in D.C., I felt uncomfortable if I sit beside someone, right? And I'd be like, I don't know how to talk to this person about my faith. But if a conversation gets started, I tried to find ways to bring Jesus in there. And I remember once, because at the time I was luxing, <laughs> I had locks in my hair. And I remember once someone came and sit beside me and asked me, you know, oh, oh where did I get my locks done? Because they were so beautiful. <laughs> and so I start talking about my locks journey and share with him the locks journey. But then I kind of itchy a little bit of story of how Jesus has been good to me to allow me to have this done. And so I use that little story and I bring in that story. You see, so I kind of share it, underline and share it into a different way. Okay. And then another time I just decided I was, my phone battery was dying, right? And so I had to get my art cover Bible out of my bag and read it. And I was just reading the Psalms, you know, and the guy who was sitting beside me said, he's so impressed that I have a paper Bible because he hasn't seen a paper Bible for a long time. And we just start talking about Bible. And so we don't need to, I think a lot of people need to do this more to share their faith, especially you now we all assume everybody else know about Jesus, but that's not true. We are coming in a generation where people don't know who Jesus is. And so we who do know the truth as the responsibility to go out there. So I can tell you, I've experienced evangelical apathy on my own. Um, and all of these things that we just talked about, they are there are one or two in almost every church where we feel entitled and preferences of things. But eventually we learn and we change and we grow. That is why the church is a hospital. No one is perfect in the church, like literally no one. And I mean from the leaders to the last of us, because we are all human and we are all learning what it means to serve Jesus. Jesus' disciples were with him, walk with him, eat with him, sleep with him, well, they still messed up sometimes. We are we are the same as Jesus disciples. We will mess up sometimes. But the good thing is that they always do what Jesus told them to do. Following his direction is what makes them his disciple. We become a disciple when we follow his direction. And this is the direction he gave us. He said we must go forth and share the gospel into all nations. Every single one of us have an obligation to cheer the gospel. It's not about inviting people to church. It's about telling people that Jesus Christ brings hope to their life. It's about telling them about the good things that he done for you. Oh, he shows up for you in such a wonderful and amazing way. We need more of that. That's where the good news is, is there. 
We need more of that in churches. And we need more church members to be prepared to go out there and to share the world and stop being so inwardly focused, like these list of 10 stuff on the building, the facility, you know, the cemetery, the things that belong to the church. We got to go outside the water for church and be focused in such a way that we are bringing hope to everyone everywhere. And that's what we need to focus on. So I'm going to share with you now some way that we can overcome these entitlements. Learning from Jesus, these are some ways that we can overcome entitlement and embrace service. First, by serving others. That's obvious, right? Serving others push us outside the water for church and it encourage people, you know, to, to see that Jesus is in us because we are loving and sharing. And the second one is to encourage participants to reflect in their own attitude and action within the church. We can say, well, how am I, how, you have to look at yourself, how am I serving? All right. And then we will talk about how we can overcome a tackle by developing a servant boss. This Sunday, we did that. This Sunday, we did that. We talk about how we can develop a servant art. It takes us looking inside of ourselves and realizing that we are coming in tackle. I had to check myself to make sure I wasn't becoming in tackle just because of my tackle as a pastor. <laughs> and so I think the way we can develop a servant art is to remember that we are here to serve one master. And that's Jesus Christ. The things we do each day is a reflection of how much we love our Savior and how much we want to serve him. My choice in changing my behavior is always to pray because I can't change it for myself. Every single day I pray for God to transform me to be more like the person he wants me to be. And if you have difficulty serving order, pray and ask God to show you the way to do